Good morning and welcome to Learn with Lorna 120 on the Caithness dialect. My name is Lorna Steele McGinn. I'm the Community Engagement Officer with the Highland Archive Service. Learn with Lorna is a series of talks designed to share the collections that we hold in our four offices at the Highland Archive Centre in Inverness, at Nucleus the Nuclear and Caithness Archives in Wick, at Loch Abbott Archive Centre in Fort William, and Sky and Loch Alsh Archive Centre in Portree. This series is brought to you by High Life Island at no cost to the viewer. High Life Island is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of talks. But if you're able to donate towards our work then we're very grateful for that and there's a link to be able to do so in the body of the text whether you're watching live on Facebook or subsequently on YouTube. I mentioned previously that, that uh, we're in the middle of a little run of pre-recorded talks and this is the last of the pre-recorded ones before I return next week, all being well. And this week we're carrying on our theme of language and communication by looking at one specific dialect in the Highlands and Islands, the Caithness dialect. And I will say straight away, Lily, uh, that I will do my utmost to say the word Caithness correctly throughout this. Um, so please know that I, I do attempt to, to get that right. Now the Caithness uh, accent and dialect is very distinct and very easily recognisable. I have a very close friend who her father was brought up in Caithness and then has lived in Glasgow for decades, but was still immediately recognised by a stranger one day as that's a Caithness accent. Uh, so, and you'd think that that would kind of be eroded a bit by a Glaswegian accent, but very distinct and very clear. Um, and it's a lovely thing I associate with my colleagues in, in Nucleus as well. I love speaking to them and, and hearing those accents. And dialects and accents is something that I have a particular interest in because, as I've mentioned through the course of these talks over the years, my degree was in language and linguistics. And so it's a particular um, passion of mine, uh, different accents and different dialects. Now, you will have no idea, maybe some of you will, just how worried I am about doing this uh, justice. My colleague Jennifer has, uh, in Nucleus has written up some notes for me. She has a beautiful Caithness accent and so if you want to hear someone doing this po uh, properly please do go up to Nucleus or speak with any of my colleagues up there who will be able to uh, explain more authentically perhaps than I can. I'm also going to share after this goes out some links to some recordings of oral histories and conversations which will allow you to hear the accent uh, after this. So let's have a look at this. The Caithness dialect is, is unique and like all languages and dialects and writing systems and in fact all forms of communication it has evolved and changed and developed over centuries as different influences came in, different people settled in the area, people left and came back uh, and as particularly as communication uh, styles changed. In addition to this, as of course in, uh, in common with other languages, it has regional variations. So even within the county of Caithness, there are variations within the dialect. I've mentioned quite a lot over the course of these talks that there is a way that Caithness is different to the rest of the Highlands and Islands for, for various reasons. It has a slightly different landscape, it has a slightly different um, set of traditions and, and it's the same with language. Much of the English used across the Highlands and Islands is influenced by Gaelic, as we looked at with uh, place names. And pronunciations are formed by the language. But the Caithness dialect has another strong shaping influence, as this extract from Jim Miller's book Caithness reveals. Now, Jim Miller, again, is somebody I have referred to several times over the course of these talks. Um, a very good friend of the Archive Service, a hugely knowledgeable writer about numerous aspects of Highland history. He is from Caithness and this is an extract from his book entitled Caithness. The dialect, with a mixture of Gaelic and Norse derivatives and with a unique handling of normal English or Lowland Scots vowels, is as evocative and laden with association as the names of the Crofts and the communities where its speakers live. It is not possible in writing to give more than an impression of the sounds of this dialect. And the variations across the region are many 
as this uh, extract shows, this is just one sentence from the Caithness book by Donald Oman. Many variations exist in pronunciation, in word forms and word meanings, and words used in one district may be quite unknown in another. There's a wonderful uh, description of the dialect that can be found in uh, a book by John Mowat called Some, uh, Some Peculiarities and Characteristics of the Caithness Dialect. Now, John Mowat was from Caithness, and amongst other things, he was one of those who was responsible for the compilation of the Scottish National Dictionary. The Scottish National Dictionary, the SND, was published in 10 volumes between 1931 and 1976 and has had subsequent editions. And together it has around, altogether it has around 29,000 entries with 172,000 quotations that are created to show words in the context that they appear. Its aim was to record all Scottish words in use or that had been in use since 1700. It's a huge, huge task. And it's now part of the DSL, the Dictionary of Scottish Language, whose praises I have sung numerous times before. And I know that there are others watching who uh, also have a great passion for the DSL. Fiona, I remember you've commented before on that. And also, I have, again, a particular interest in this. At university, my uh, dissertation was on the history of the Oxford English Dictionary, which people always assume is really boring, and it really isn't. Um, so dictionaries, again, are a real uh, passion of mine. Now, the Scottish National Dictionary relied on numerous contributors sending in information about words, the context of those words, history, pronunciation, etc. And John Moore was one of those who supplied information about the Caithness dialect. And we hold a collection of John Mowat's papers in Nucleus and his handwritten notes from 1948 give an insight into the evolution of the Caithness dialect and record some of the common words in use. This is an extract from that. The true original Caithness tongue is confined to a very limited area in that part of the county north of a line drawn from Keith to Castleton, where there remains or did remain longer the peculiar characteristics of the Caithness tongue in its pristine splendour. And it goes on to say that the parishes of Canisby and Dunnet, which compose a greater part of the East, are a mecca of old word hunters. Great title, the old word hunters. The new Scottish dictionary draws the boundary line through Caithness at a point further south and gives the area as north of a line drawn from Claithness to four miles west of Thurso. In the belt across the county between the two lines I have indicated, you can see this uh, illustrated on his map, includes the landward parish of Wick, with the parishes of Bower, Watton and Ulrich, and parts of the parish of Thurso. Ray, Holkirk and Latherin comprise the area where Gaelic was much more spoke, recently spoken. And this is um, something that really kind of illustrates the the, the area, again, that reference to the different influences. So Gaelic's been spoken in some area, which means the influence on the language is different. And John Mowat went on to say, the speech of the Tunawik has been described as mongrel and shows traces from wi of widely different dialects. The reason for this is the varied sources from which the population has been drawn. So again, always in an area of bigger population, there'll be more uh, variation. There has been an influx from other parts of Scotland, and words and accents have been assimilated by the natives. It is quite apparent that there's been a rapid change in the Caithness dialect in the last quarter of a century, a greater change than in the three quarters of the century before. This may be accounted for by the greater influx of tourists, by the holiday migrations of the inhabitants, by the influence of the wireless and the British Broadcasting Co Corporation, but perhaps most of all by an adherence to schoolbook English and the tendency of youth in these modern days not to use an Aboriginal word if a dictionary word can be used instead. Now that was obviously written several decades ago, but you can see, um, interesting uses the word uh, Aboriginal, um, but this is a point that Caithness dialect has in common with everywhere, so many areas and languages and dialects, that the influence of the radio and then the TV and then the internet can be seen across the world in that merging of accents and a lot of loss of regional dialect spellings and word variations 
And it's one of those things, I'm sure we will all have met someone from um, pick a country and they will come out with an American accent or a very similar to an American accent that you don't quite expect. But of course, it's because a lot of the influence has come from um, films or um, other sources like that. Now, for centuries, the change in dialect was much slower, but as travel increased and then communication increased, languages across the country and across the world changed much more quickly than ever. And that's why we really start to see uh, a big drive to store these words, to, to record them, to save them, to preserve what's been before, before it disappears. Interesting as well that Moet in that extract mentions the role of schoolbook English because this is another very powerful thing in language change, the role of education. And we'll see that uh, in next week as well in the Cameron and Gale, uh, Lerb and Thorne, sorry, in a, in a few weeks where we talk about uh, the Gaelic language. And if you have, if any of you have had a chance to look at the education exhibition that we put together to mark the, the 150th anniversary of the Education Act this year, you'll see that imposing of a standard language across an education system has a very, very quick impact on diminishing or standardising uh, regional dialects and variations. So between the imposed standardising of education and the casual absorption of TV, it's amazing really that we have any dialects or regional variations left at all. But of course, we really do. In, in, in Britain, across the British Isles, we have, um, across the whole of uh, the British Isles, some extraordinary dialects. You would never mistake someone from Liverpool for someone from Dublin or someone from um, Glasgow. So we're really blessed in this country with different accents and dialects. OK, so what about the Caithness dialect? Well, there are several things to consider when you're studying the differences between any dialects. The pronunciation of words, the sentence structure used, the words themselves, and phrases and idioms. So let's start with pronunciation, and this is where uh, I may make or break my relationship with my Caithness colleagues, uh, but hopefully they're fond enough of me to let it go. There are certain letters or sounds pronounced differently in Caithness, and some of these mimic Gaelic and vice versa. So, for instance, this is an extract from the Caithness book by John Ormond again. It goes on to explain that um, some of the, the different features of Caithness speech. So J and soft G at the beginning of a word becomes CH. So Janet becomes Chanet. Giant becomes Chiant. Broad A becomes A. E as in pig or big. Become, so instead of being e, eh, becomes e, so pig becomes peak, wick becomes weak, u becomes e in certain words, so fool becomes feel, or foot becomes feet, which is eh, slightly confusing for a, a singular and a, a plural. Diphthongs can change, so that's a diphthong is uh, two vowel sounds put together, so head becomes heed. Boy becomes B, B, I think it's B, phone to Caithness stuff, they'll be able to explain. Ch becomes sh in, uh, in Canisby district. And this is one of the things I think is particularly noticeable when I speak to my colleagues in Caithness. TH is sometimes removed, so instead of saying the, they'll say a, uh, or instead of saying this, they'll say is, which is really interesting because obviously most things that get elided, uh, elided or, or dropped are dropped from an end of a word, whereas this is a uh, dropping of the start of the word. A final ET can become AT, and so things like uh, bonnet will become bonnet, or ND becomes N, so AN instead of AND, which is much more common than that TH missing. The final ING can become AN, so singing, walking, rather than walking. And the initial WH can become F, so fa for who, fan for when, or falango for walango. There are also certain phrases which are particularly common. And 
it was really interesting putting this together because as I was doing it, I could I could hear clearly my Caithness Nucleus colleagues in my head as I read them through. And again, I can only uh, apologise to them for my attempts to do this. So, so many words, and again, this is something common to, to several dialects, are run together at such speed that they become a new word. So, Faryafi, where are you from? Faryafi, Giza had it here. Give me a hold of it here. Give it to me. Some of those are, you know, are, are replicated or similarly used across different parts of Scotland. Far's my dinner. Where's my dinner? But this was one I thought was particularly uh, associated with this dialect. I'm filled to the throat. I'm full to the throat. I'm choked with emotion. And it's all written out as one word. I'm filled to the throat. And one of the ones that uh, that Jen and Nucleus highlighted to me was an answer to fits a crack a day. So what's the news today? What's happening? And the answer is just hanging together like a wheat peat. So the answer is I'm just hanging together like a wet peat. So fits a crack a day is something again it's, it's bears a resemblance to an Aberdonian accent or uh, um, that, that fit is particularly associated with there, but fits a crack a day. So just the E instead of the, and then a day instead of today. And another answer that you'll hear commonly is not much a day by fit like yourself. So not much news for me, What what's, what's happening with you? And there are some great uh, other phrases that you may know from elsewhere, such as, do you mind? Do you remember that? Or it's ourselves or it's ourselves. Now, one of the things that causes issues to anyone unfamiliar um, with, a di with a new dialect uh, is, is when it's said at speed. So my partner is from the borders and we have family members, as, as I've mentioned previously, in New Zealand. And when those New, Ze new Zealand family members or uh, people who've come into the family in New Zealand listen to Granny, they just, you can see them going, I, don't, I just don't know what you're saying because it's such a strong Borders accent. And so that's um, always really fun to hear. And I think that looking at that sort of Farifei Gizahada here, um, Farsman, things like that, if you're not familiar with the kind of constituent parts of what those words are, it takes you a bit of time to build them up. One I thought was particularly um, Caithnesian there is that one about I'm full to the throat is I'm full to a throat so it's till till a throat so they would use the word till instead of the word to and again that's something that I hear a lot in my colleagues. I mentioned that a lot of uh, dialect words can be squashed by the education system either actively or passively so sometimes people will be told they do not use that phrase uh, because it's not the, you know the, the official terminology or, or something but also just passively so our nephews who left Scotland and are now in New Zealand their accent is changing because they're in the education system so although they're still at home with people with a very strong Scottish accent they're part of the education surrounded by uh, a different accent and there are examples for, uh, in the nucleus collections of dialect sometimes being lost, but particularly of dialect being encouraged. And it's something I've not seen elsewhere, and I'm sure it will be to the envy of our colleagues on the West Coast and uh, Sky Loch Alsh and Loch Aber, who have seen the, the kind of discipline around using Gaelic, to find this extract in the Gursa school logbook in uh, Caithness, dated the 8th of June, uh, 1784, so not long after the Education Act. And this says, the teacher has written usual work Royal Reader number five appear to relish their composition exercises very much. So they're working through this book and they're writing exercises. Generally, an anecdote is read to them. Occasionally, the ideas are then reproduced in the Caithness vernacular to in very amusing terms. So not only are they composing a piece of writing, but they're then redoing it in the Caithness vernacular dialect, which is extraordinary. And he goes on to say, the teacher goes on to say, a Newfoundland, uh, a Newfoundland dog was said to have taken ample satisfaction 
for an insult offered by the little dogs. So obviously the little dogs have attacked him and he's attacked them back. And the teacher who wanted to say the work on the slates represented these dogs as having been thumped, thrashed, settled because they fettled on the Newfoundlander and he could not thole such cheek. I love that. It's really actively encouraging the use of your natural dialect and it's so, so important. Um, we never had one way or the other at school. We weren't told not to say things and we weren't encouraged to say things. But my mum, who I'm sure will be watching, really detests my glottal stop where I miss my, um, where I don't pronounce my T's correctly. And I, blessedly, when I went to university and I was able to come back with a name for it and go, that's my glottal stop. It's a, a dialectal feature. So uh, I can't I can't stop doing it. It's important for diversity. Um, but I love that extract from the Gersa school logbook of someone, uh, the teacher actively encouraging them to rewrite something in their local words. Now, we spoke last week about place names and the way that place names are capsules of information about the past and the people and the languages and the cultures that have come into contact with our places. And this is as apparent in Caithness as it is anywhere else. And that interaction with both Gaelic and Norse that I mentioned earlier is immediately apparent when you look at a, a map of the area. And I wanted to share two extracts with you from books that we've already looked at by John Mowat and by Jim Miller. And this is the first. The Caithness dialect on the whole reflects pretty accurately the history of the county. There are dialect peculiarities that can be traced to Celtic sources. This is more prominent in the south and the west where the Gallic influence persisted longest. In the east and the north where the Scandinavian conquest was most felt and where the invaders settled and remained, the Norse influence still remains. Then there was the original race on which those two language influences were superimposed. So that's from John Mowat. Jim Miller goes on to say, Gaelic has left a, lag a legacy both in dialect words and in place names. And he goes on to list Altnabrech, uh, Acherol, Altnabay, various different place names. Now, in description, simple describing terms, but couched in their original vo vocables, uh, evocative sounds rolling off the tongue with a flavour of sea wind and heather tang in them. Along the coasts and the burns of the northeast coast, Norse words carry the same whiff of history with equal ease. Short staccato syllables, wick, stain, ness, tang, hunna, klet, and the thump of the clinker riveted pine against the wave in them. Beautiful. Jim, I love the way you write things. But that description of the Gallic words that have the flavour of sea wind and heather tang in them as opposed to those Norse influenced words that have the, the short staccato syllables and the thump of clinker riveted pine. Fantastic. Um, and of course, it's not just place names. There are numerous words that are used across Scotland and across Caithness, such as a burach for a mess, a loon for a boy, oxter for your armpit, which was really recent that I discovered not everyone said that. And then I was like, well, what, what do people say if they don't say oxters? Feeling a bit peely wally or looking a bit peely wally, um, looking pale, uh, as I often do, pale and faint. Stir for mess. And all of these words are found across Scotland and found in Caithness. So there's some that transcend across the geography and others are found just in the north in Caithness, Orkney and Shetland. And again, talking about that difference that Caithness sometimes has, they often have more in common in Caithness with Orkney and Shetland and the islands than they do with, for instance, Nairnshire or um, Loch Aber. So although technically they sit within Highlands and Islands, they often have more in common with those areas that also have that big Norse influence. And some words are pretty much exclusive to Caithness. And many of these can be found in the fantastic Caithness Dictionary by Ian Sutherland. All of these words are really evocative and really pictorial, and you'll know me well enough to know that that's, I'm all about that. So, unka for strange or unaccustomed. It's, it's, it's unka, or it's unka weird, unka strange. The Kirkgangers, 
the congregation. Makes complete sense. They're the people going to the church. Gluff, a fright. One that my line manager uses to me very often. Trackled. You're looking trackled. Careworn and overworked. That's what I get. You're awful trackled today. My favourite one that I've come across and my colleagues probably across all the offices will be laughing at me now because the word forky tail. Now, the word forky tail apparently in Caithness and across different areas, and I'll look forward to your comments, uh, means an earwig. Now, when my Caithness colleagues told me this, I said, that's fantastic. That's so descriptive, a forky tail for an earwig. And I was telling my line manager who said, well, yeah, of course. Don't you say that? What, what do you say for an earwig? I said, well, I just say earwig. And this started a whole debate where I was calling colleagues in other offices and asking them. And Catherine and Sky said, no, we don't say forky tail. I don't say forky tail. And Rory and Fort William said, we don't, I don't say forky tail. But my colleague Fionag, whose parents are, uh, whose mother is from uh, Dundee, she said, oh, yes, I use the word forky tails. And it's become a whole debate across the service. So do let me know if you say forky tail or if you've got any other um, interesting ones. Because nature is a fantastic place to see re regional dialectal words. So if you've got any from your area, please do share them with me. Uh, it's always a place of, in, in plants, in wildlife, is a place where those local associations survive. And here are some examples that Jen pulled for, for me from Ian Sutherland's Caithness Dictionary uh, and a collection that's held at Nucleus. So what about these? A green linty, a green finch, a scory for a seagull. Now, I spoke about a story when I did um, an episode about the atomic, the workers at Dunray, and, uh, and there was a story of a scory flying through a window and stealing something from somebody. But I had to look up the word scorry because I didn't know what it was. And at that point, it could have been anything from a thief to a seagull. And uh, it was a seagull. Um, but that's something that is said regularly elsewhere. Brock for a badger. That was one that transcends a little bit more, I think. It wasn't until I read this, that Clegg for horsefly, that I realised that it's not just called a Clegg. So some you don't question. A Corby for a carrion crow. A do for a pigeon, you'll maybe know that one. A filchin moose for a bat, filchin moose. A hairy brotic for a tiger moth caterpillar. A shocket for a peewit, and a peewit in itself is a nickname for a lapwing. Uh, a gowan for a daisy. Um, what else can I share with you? Ranag for bracken. A tatty bogle for a green skinned potato. Now, in my head, a tatty bogle was a scarecrow. So I'll need to chase that one and find out. But one of my favourite ones, apart from the forky tail, obviously, was a clever feats for a rabbit. Clever feats. And as I say, those things of that have those long local associations of the plants that grow locally or the animals that you find locally, they're a great place to look for dialectal words. Now, I mentioned earlier that dialects and accents are under constant threat, both from deliberate and inadvertent forces, from the TV, from education, etc. But sometimes measures are put in place to actively encourage and promote difference in voices, and this is what has happened in Caithness. The first Caithness Music Festival was held in Wick Rifle Hall on the 13th of June 1924, under the name the Wick Musical Competition Festival. And it was a huge success, that first one. And the John O'Groat Journal recorded the whole event, including all the prize winners, all the speeches, the photographs uh, and comment. And that annual event is now known as the Caithness Music Festival, and it continues to grow strong, as uh, there are other music festivals across the Highlands and Islands. But the interesting one is uh, the interesting thing about this is that it actively works to promote the Caithness dialect with poetry categories where children perform specially written poems in the Caithness dialect. And events like this are incredibly important in keeping language alive. And we'll share uh, some of these with you after uh, this talk for you to have a look at. And so the dialect is being kept actively alive and quite rightly so, because as Jim Miller says, it is a living link with history. 
and the continuity of life, and it would be the greatest of shames if it were to go. I hope you've enjoyed uh, learning something about the Caithness dialect with me. I'll put up a post uh, after this with links where you can go and listen to some extracts on Ambala and hear um, the accent, but also those things like the word the, eh, for the, and is, and going till something instead of going to something, you'll be able to hear uh, all of that. So worth going and having a look in, uh, on Ambala for our uh, some oral history recordings, and also having a look uh, at a talk recently given by Agav McClodge about Gaelic in Southwest Caithness. Thank you again for joining me. Next week I will be back live, all, assuming all has gone well and I've got back into the country fine, uh, for a look at a really different use of language and communication. Diaries, something that's a form of, of communication and language that's written without an audience in mind. So I hope you can join me for that. Thank you uh, for listening and thank you to those of you in Caithness, uh, A, for your lovely accents and dialects, but also for hopefully not judging me too bad for my pronunciations. A reminder that this series is brought to you by High Life Highland at no cost to the viewer. That High Life Highland is a charity registered in Scotland and there's no payment or subscription required to take part in this series of talks. But if you're able to donate towards our work, then we very much appreciate that. Thank you. <laughs>